is the release of KISS, and hi, I'm Optics. So, um, I, I'm going to... No, it'll work. It just takes bigger font. Uh, do you want to be able to see it? <laughs> no, I think it's, in. it's not my laptop, so. <laughs> yeah, you can do bigger fonts if you want to. Let's do our all extras. Um, oh, wait, you no. have to All right, so now. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to start by uh, showing how to configure the client and the server. Um, you, you actually configure the, the, the server with uh, the client. So you go to server con option, server config. And um, you have to set a modulus and a remainder value and uh, key one and key two, uh, which act as passwords. And then you have to specify an install directory and the binary to Trojan. And then I click save. And you, you save this as a header file, so server.h, and then copy this over to the directory of, well, I'll demonstrate that in a second. Um, okay, so. So here I've already got the server.h copied over. And um, so I copy that to the KISS server source tree directory and I do um, make and note the disclaimer um, for educational purposes only um, I, I'd like to make this clear this is an educational tool and it oh wait and it makes a binary uh, called KISS um, and then if I run that, then I go back over to my uh, GUI and I do options and client configuration. Um, here I can choose if I want to spoof the source of the packets, um, if I want to get results, um, and then you have to set the local IP and port. Um, if you, uh, the, you have to set the local IP that you're sending the packets from. So if you're behind a NAT network, you have to uh, specify the external IP of your NAT box. This is 60. And then I can save this as client.h. And save. And you see it's bound to the uh, socket so that I can receive results because I checked the get options box. Um, the, the first option is ping, and we specify the target here. It doesn't matter what port we fire the commands to because that is uh, irrelevant to the protocol that KISS uses. So I can specify a random port, um, and then I can send a ping, and you see I get the ping response. Um, <coughs> Uh, shut down server obviously shuts down the server. Um, remove server um, removes it so that it, it restores the binary that it backdoored. And um, if you if you look at the uh, binary that I backdoored, um, 
it, it hasn't been modified. The the it's on the same inode because it copies a backup and then redirects syscalls uh, for file to statistics back over to the original file. Um, so so it, it it looks unmodified. Um, Yes, um, and whenever you do remove, it replaces and restores the original binary the way it was um, whenever you installed it. Um, okay, I'm going to skip over a few of these features um, and come back to them. Um, list p hides. This lists all the hidden processes on the machine. Um, I can hide processes. So here I have two shells logged in, or actually a lot. Um, can you exit out of those shells? Yeah, sure. And so here, here I have uh, three shells logged in, and um, currently I'm on uh, TTY3, the PTS3, and I see the PID of the bash I'm running is uh, 1152. So I go over to my GUI and I enter an 11.52 hide process and it says PID 152 hidden. Um, so if I list processes in the terminal that's not hidden, um, I see 11.52 is no longer listed for shells running. Um, but inside the hidden process, um, I can still see it. Um, from here, it, it, it automatically hides any files, directories, network connections that I make inside hidden processes. So if I tell that out to another host, um, you, you, you don't see the connection in the connection listing. Um, LSOF won't pick it up either. Uh, any? Oh, LSOF is. On. Oh, no, no, that on my machine. Um, uh, this is all done at the kernel level, so that bypasses LSOF. Um, uh, which? KStat. KStat. Um, KStat. Uh, actually, yes, and um, uh, I'll get to that in a second. Um, and so inside hidden processes, I make a directory. Um, I and I look in my non-hidden process, and I don't see it. Um, and I can see it inside the hidden process. I can change directory to it um, inside a hidden process. I cannot change directory to it. It looks like it does not exist. Um, you, you cannot you cannot stat these files. You cannot rename them as in outside of hidden processes. Um, and in, and uh, another thing about the binary trojaning, it redirects uh, stuff like uh, uTime and uh, to update the time on it. So you can touch the file and it'll actually update the original that it's kept uh, as backup. <coughs> so. Um, it, it, it returns a, a bad permission, um, so that, that I mean that that's an un, unreversible way of uh, of of detecting this. Uh, but you'd have to know the exact file name. Um, uh, but you can't really get around that. Um, that that uh, uh, in, inside a non-hidden shell, if you try and make a, dire a directory or a file that's hidden. Um, if if uh, what what's the error message or does it work for uh, a user in a non-hidden shell? Um, and hmm? okay, proof is in the butter. All right, and you see that it says file exists. Um, you can return any error. It's configurable to, uh, you just change the error return value so you can say eperm 
Um, uh, it, it, any error you want, you can even say, have it say that it doesn't have enough pageable memory, which confuses the hell out of people. Um, I can I can unhide processes from the GUI. Um, I can remotely start processes as hidden or unhidden. So if I do uh, uh, hidden CP Etsy shadow to temp Bob, it says it started the process as PID 1331, uh, and I see it copied the file. So. All right, so um, execution redirection. Um, a, a, a common problem that, that a lot of hackers run into is um, if you mi modify binaries on disk, um, then it, the, if they're running a, checks, a binary check somewhere like Tripwire, it'll, it'll catch that you've modified the binary. Um, what this does is whenever you execute a program, uh, it uh, actually executes another program, but it's transparent to user space, so the program thinks that it's running out of uh, the, the, the location that you specified to run. So if I do bin cheon to bin ps, I see that I got a process listing when I run cheon. Um, so I could do this with SSHD and have it actually execute a Trojan SSHD, and it would any file sum checker would not pick this up. Based off of the exact VE strings. No, it, it's actually whenever it calls the exec VE syscall, it sees the string bin cheon and it redirects it to uh, uh, bin ps, but it doesn't modify argv, so the program thinks it's running as bin cheon. Yes. Um, no, I've got a command line client. Um, it's it's on my web page. Um, I'll I'll mention that in a bit. Um, file system controls. I can hide un hide uh, files, list the hidden files, and there's there's two methods of hiding files. Um, the one that it ships by default, it actually keeps an internal linked list, so that there's uh, nothing. Uh, it doesn't modify anything to do with the file, but a, a method that the Tesso guys and a few other people used was is they changed it to a, a UID, and, and if, if the file matched that UID, then it would hide it from directory listings. The problem with this is you can just pull through change owning a file uh, through all possible UIDs, and if it disappears, you know you've been owned, and that's a problem. Um, network control, you can uh, hide, unhide network connections. If you specify just a port, it'll hide everything coming in from that port. If you specify an IP colon zero, it'll hide all connections from that machine. Um, um, the the plugin interface, um, it, it it has the capability to use uh, kernel modules as plugins or user space binaries as kernel plugins. Um, inside hidden processes, you can exec VE uh, uh, kernel com uh, kernel uh, functions. So let me demonstrate that. Um, um, well, here I'll show you the code for this first. So. All this does is a standard exec VE of any arguments you pass in, and as the file name parameter, if you pass in a zero, it won't print anything if it has return values. If you specify one, it'll print it out to the current TTY. So I specified one so that I can see what I'm doing. Um, and I can do, say, hide file, um, temp, and it says temp hidden. And uh, yeah, so that's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, it's for Linux 2.2 and 2.4. Um, this is very kernel specific code because it is a kernel module. 
Um, but you could easily port it over to other platforms because it's just the concepts that you have to port over. Um, and so I can I can load plugins, um, and I'll get back to the plugin interface after I talk about the communication. Um, so this this all communicates without listening ports. Um, the traffic can be spoofed both ways, um, and you can still get results even if you spoof it. Um, I can do a demonstration of that. Um, and to the client, you can pass in parameters minus C, and then the client header file, and then minus S, and the server header file, so you don't have to go through the config again. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I guess I can't do that. Um, okay, so if I go back to my client config, um, <clears throat> I can select the spoof box and specify an IP. If I specify an IP of zero, um, it spoofs from a random source IP every time. Um, if I specify a port of zero, it spoofs from a random port every time. Um, the, the, an easy way to get through firewalls, since this is all loosely based on the UDP protocol, um, it's routed as UDP. Um, you can spoof source port 53 in the IP of their name server and hop through a lot of firewalls. Um, so I'll just do random. Yes, educational purposes. Uh, as in, like, different le levels of access to this? In times of port? Oh, no, I can specify any port. So I can specify nine. Uh, I, I don't get it. All right. I could, yeah. Um, so, all right, that's a good port number, I think. Okay, so I think this feature is broken under OpenBSD. I've only tested the client spoofing capabilities under Linux, but uh, uh, yeah. Um, so the way the communication works is is I came I came to the problem that a lot of other uh, uh, remote control agents, it's it's easy to tell if they're hooking the IP stack because it increases the latency of the IP stack, and um, you can detect it with anti sniffers. Um, so what I did was, is whenever you set up the client in, or the server configuration, uh, you specified a modulus value, a remainder value, and the two keys. What it does is, is when a packet comes in off the IP stack, it takes a modulus of the length of the packet, and if the remainder matches, it's a possible command packet. From there, it passes it on to SHA, where it takes the source IP, the destination IP, the destination port, and shared secret one, which is key one, sends that through SHA and XORs the packet with it. And if the first part of the packet matches shared secret two, then it's a valid command packet. Um, this means if you change the port you're firing it to, it, it completely changes the encryption key. Um, if you change the source IP, it changes the encryption key. Um, yeah, so it can be signatured. Uh, the traffic can't, that is. Yeah, it, 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 when it generates the IP, it, when it's doing the encryption of the packets, it uses that IP that it randomly generated as. Uh, if, if, excuse me? Um, no, if you, if you change the port that you're sending the command to, it'll, it'll, uh, um, Oh, yes, yes. It would be the same uh, encryption uh, system. Um, so, uh, what else? Okay, um, as far as the plugin capabilities go, um, you, can, you can just take and compile plugins that, there's a plugin interface for the kernel that I, I wrote. It uses the standard module loading capabilities. Um, you just have to define a few functions and all this does is, is send you back what you specified as an argument. Um, so I compile this. Oh, yeah. All 
Okay, that's uh, uh, Red, Red Hat 7.0 decided to switch with beta builds of GCC, and so you get tons of assembler me or warnings um, because that was a poor move on their part. <laughs> so what I can do to load plugins is I can either load them through the client or if I want them to load at startup, I can just cat them to the back of the KISS server and they'll, the, they'll load, it, it recursively loads anything you clip onto the back of it. Um, and, and, um, yeah. So. Should we scream yes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so, well, there's, there's some other options. Yeah. Hey, 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 hey. There's some other options I, I've got in here as well. Um, there's, you can, you can define, um, by default, it, it ships this way, anti-security, which means anti-security modules. It can actively disable um, uh, every kernel-based IDS I found um, uh, with, without it knowing about it. Um, and, and if you want to add new modules to the list, it's really easy. You just edit the KISS header fi or KISS C file. Um, let me look. So you just add a string compare. You can choose to either let it load and then disable it, or just never let it load and not tell the user. <laughs> um, right, right now, it actively disables Carbonite, uh, the Linux Mac implementation, uh, St. Michael and St. Jude. Um, in, in the mod list? Um, Um, yeah, it, it'll find it in memory and remove it. Um, the same way it finds itself in memory and removes it. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, I didn't show this, but I did, if you do an LS mod, it doesn't show any, it doesn't show that KISS is loaded. Um, and it, this is all done in the module itself as opposed to the way St. Michael does it by loading a secondary module, which removes it from the list, and that's very easily flagged. And once it's doing the initialization process is when I remove it. Or, and if it's already loaded, it'll just find it in kernel space and, and unload it. Um, and uh, an, another options that it has, um, you can define elite GID and hide the way, uh, use, use GID based hiding. Um, th th this is the method I talked about before where you can easily find it if you just uh, che on a file over and over and over until finally the file disappears. Um, what's another option I added? Oh no, that's it. That's all I ship with. <coughs> so there's other things in, in development. Yeah, th th there's other plugins uh, in development, um, and the plugin interface is very easy to learn, and you don't have to deal with interrupts from user space. You had a question. Yeah. Um, cur currently, um, you you. You could detect this version with KSTAT. Um, I've got other code which will beat KSTAT. Um, it's a plug into this. Um, that may or may not be made public, um, de depending on the reaction of the security community to this. Um, um, and, um, OK. Um, actually. Here's, here, here's the funny thing. Here, here, here's, the, here, here's the funny thing. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I wrote a uh, completely in the kernel sign module loader so that you kept a signing tool and a key on another machine or a floppy disk and you just signed all the modules you wanted to load into kernel space so that it would only load verified code into kernel space. And I had 50 downloads in six months, so I just took it off my website because apparently people weren't concerned with this even though it's a big problem. Yeah. Let's say my box is compromised and they start using it as a file dumping place. If someone has a file for the dumping site, does this break when I get to see the file size? Does that free space change? Yes, actually, you would because you can't hide that on Extended 2 or Riser. I don't know about other file systems.
Yeah. Um, well, well, here's here's a way to detect it, but you're good. It, it involves downing the machine. Um, if you do a find and just map out your whole hard drive, like from root, and then you shut the machine down, boot off of another disk, and then mount that drive. Um, not as root, however, and then map it out. If you see any hidden files that uh, weren't there before, then that's probably where it's located, and there's a nice backup of it kept there, of your original file, so you can restore it. Um, anything else? Um, I, I've got a module which is on my web page, that, that a plugin for this that does that. Um, if you're inside a hidden, if you're inside a hidden process and you throw the device into promiscuous mode, it won't show that it's hidden or that it's in promiscuous mode. But if you do it as an admin, it will. Or as a. Are both sides? No, the, the the client actually listens on a port. It's standard UDP traffic. Oh. Um, you, uh, KISS also has anti-KISS capabilities. Um, <laughs> So that you can use it as a you can use it as a, it, it's very easy if you just drop in plugins to make it a security product. You can make it into whatever you want, and it'd be great for the HoneyNet project for remotely managing machines. <coughs> um, no, uh, they'd have to know the modulus, the remainder value, and both shared secrets. It's it's standard GTK. Um, this is OpenBSD, um, but I, I there's I don't know why the raw sockets don't work on this right now. Um, I'm root and. Yeah. Wait 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 wait. Okay, so my, my, my website is uh, uberhacksor.net. Uh, yeah. Uberhacksor with an O. U, U B E H R. Or, yeah, U B E R H A X 0 R.net. And then the download site is forward slash kiss, but there's a link to it off the main page. Should we taunt for awareness? I think we should taunt them. Okay. Dude, quality HTML. I added my first picture to the web.
a special move exploit. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, boot them. They, they, they won't boot, but... <laughs> All right, so that's it. <laughs>